<laughs> hey guys and welcome back to another video. So today we're just going to be looking a little bit at an overview of the masks and how they've changed, what's kind of benefited them, what seems to be a little bit weaker in this edition uh, in general. This is going to be more of an overview video of which mask you might want to choose or you know, also me asking you guys questions about how you feel about how things are working at the moment. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed and who continues to follow the content. We've now reached 401 subs, so we've pushed the 400 mark, which is really, really cool um, for me and in terms of me making this. And, you know, it's a very niche idea with this channel, so I, I didn't expect to receive so much support and you guys have been awesome. Uh, especially some of you guys who've been here from the beginning and uh, have helped me to set up the Facebook page and everything and continue with the discussion. I really do appreciate it, so thank you. Um, so looking at some of the changes and how they might have sort of helped some of the masks. So one example is obviously the first one was the Midnight Sorrow. So the Midnight Sorrow has a couple of really key sort of aspects here, but is definitely still suited to a very, very high skill level player. That six inch consolidation move on a smaller board means that you're covering even more of a percentage of the board area and able to get to more and more of these objectives in a very, very objective based game. So I don't think this is a bad thing at all. And I do think that they've received a bit of an indirect buff. Even the Warlord trait now with some of our psychic awakening shenanigans like the Twilight Fang and Darkness Bites combo on the Troop Master, if you can then, you know, by round five, uh, get sort of 10 attacks where sixes are potentially causing additional hits. And if you really want to, you can give them the Great Harlequin. So then you've got an even greater chance of getting those additional hits. You can get a huge amount of damage out of that Troop Master. So this is a really, really good Warlord trait for that particular Kind of combination and um, I, I really I can see that working I've seen a few people who decide to now start running that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good trait to have in terms of the stratagem of course it's the same as it's always been fantastic on solitaires okay on other characters gives them a little bit of a boost and, and helps their, their killing power on top of everything else so it's a really good mask it requires a huge huge skill level which, to be honest, I don't know if I, I would necessarily take this Master Tournament myself because I just don't feel confident at being able to get the most out of it. Um, but if you've been using it and you've been enjoying it, let everyone know what's your strategy with it. How is it that you're getting the most out of this mask with all of its little shenanigans? Like, but I think they do seem to have gained at least a sort of an indirect buff. Um, the next would be the, um, the Soaring Spike. Everyone's favorite mask from 8th edition in terms of your fusion boat spam. Uh, and this mask just isn't going away. Not anytime soon. Um, we'll see what happens with a new codex. But people who like their fusion boats, um, you're much, you're, you're still in business basically. You know, the Star Weaver's still at 80 points. A troop with a caress and a fusion pistol is still 25 points. You're probably taking away a, a few bikes or whatever. But honestly, you're onto a winner. It's an MSU edition. It works very, very well. You've got a stratagem that can still you know, help you to, to stay safe. And then if you've got those little boats and they get destroyed and the troops jump out, you're still taking that objective. You know, It's a strong play style. Um, also considering things like you know, using the, the Warlord trait to then be able to jump out with a Shadow Seer who can then reduce the attacks of everyone. And then also you know, can give the shield, um, shield from harm. And then you've got you know, 15 jet bikes coming in the front lines and, you know, potentially re-rolling all their wounds as well if you can get your troop master close enough. And it's it's a very, very powerful mask for these little combos that can really help you to get up that board. The only thing that I will say is that with the smaller board size is how much do you really need to advance? You do in particular situations, but is it really going to be the core of your strategy that you need to advance every single time? I don't know. Let me know what you've been thinking or, or how you've been using it. I've considered playing a bit of Soaring Spike mostly for that jump out bike combo, but um, in terms of the fusion boats, I'm still not sold on them just because I, I just don't roll that hot. So it, it's not my way of playing Harlequins. I like them. Um, I like why I can see why people like them, but I, I, it's just not my way of playing, you know. But they are a powerful mask, and I can definitely see this continuing for some time. 
Uh, Frozen Stars with their extra attack have... I mean, they're definitely still powerful. You know, the, the extra attack on an already combat-focused army is definitely fantastic. But you, you have to worry a little bit now with the MSU about overkill um, and leaving your units more and more exposed. And with the, the addition of all these blast weapons to really kind of counter things like the large units of troops, I can see maybe a couple of units of 10 running around, but we're not going to see those big units of 12 with, you know, X number of close combat weapons running around quite as often as we might have done coming to the wards the end of 8th, which I think is a bit of a shame. It was nice to see a different kind of competitive build coming in. However, you know, that's the nature of the game, and they're still a strong mask, you know. Um, think about things like the Ghoul Mask even, it, it might not be the most powerful relic, but now that we've got psychic actions and things, it might be worth taking, you know. Um, just, it might cost a relic, but it could you know, stop different psychers from, from, you know, getting more points. And if you've got a Shadow Seer as well and a Troop Master with a Ghoul Mask or something, then you can really start to, to really get into their lines and stop them from performing these actions. Um, otherwise, in terms of the stratagem, it's always been powerful. The plus one to wound is obviously a good thing. But again, if we're in an MSU edition, it's like, how much killing power do you need? When is it overkill, you know? And that's, I think, where the Frozen Stars have started to get a little bit more situational in terms of how they would be played. I always rated them in 8th edition, I still rate them, I just don't think that they have necessarily the tools that we require at this point in time. Um, moving on to the Dreaming Shadow. This is the mask that I'm actually genuinely considering running through most of 9th, as, you know, until we get the new codex and we see all the new, the new toys, etc. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the trait itself is it's a bit situational, it's very swingy, so being able to shoot again when you die, that sort of thing. I think the Warlord trait couples quite well with it, but then you're isolating yourself into particular areas and you need that movement. So I have been playing around with the idea of just having like a big unit of bikes and a big unit of troops to dominate the board and then have everything else sort of fanning out and capturing things. Um, and then with Necrons potentially coming in as the new hotness, you could also add two to those rolls and then on twos you're shooting as you die and because of the smaller board size you're more likely to be in range of a lot of different things. So I do think that actually this mask has give, been given a bit of an inadvertent buff. Now with the, NA, uh, the FAQ as well for um, the Death Jester's rolls, including only ignoring cover on sixes now with um, the, uh, the Just Inescapable, and Humbling Cruelty now not affecting the Whale or Shrieker profile. Um, that's going to be an interesting, sorry, not Humbling Cruelty, um, Harvester of Torment. Uh, that's going to be giving that stratagem to be able to then add additional shots, actually a little bit of versatility. So a Death Jester with the Harvester of Torment, but then also having the potential to be able to shoot the Shrieker profile twice, if not three times if you roll the six, could actually give your DJs like you know a, a few different options, and if you're targeting something with the um, the Harvester of Torment trait, then you can save that um, stratagem for something like the Shadow Seer's hallucinogen grenades, or for the uh, Troop Master with a fusion pistol shooting twice. You know these sorts of things can actually be quite a buff. Additionally, yes, okay, the the trait otherwise works in the same way, but being able to avoid combat attrition in this. It, it, it does seem to work quite well. It works better now with smaller units um, so that you can avoid the attrition whilst before it was really purely for like you big blobs of troops that this would ever come into effect. So I, I'm quite liking Dreaming Shadow now, not because I think that they have one particular thing that makes them stronger than the other masks, but because they have a lot of different things that make them a very interesting like middle ground mask with some you know good shooting potential they've still got the same melee potential but they can add on to it as well by attacking when they die so yeah i'm, I'm really enjoying this mask actually I, I think this is um probably the one that i'm going to run also because i like the law behind them and uh, i've got a small tournament like a progressive tournament we're starting at a thousand points happening next week and my my list is going to be dreaming shadow just to see how that all works Last but not least, we do have the Silent Shroud. Now, unfortunately, I think the Silent Shroud has been given a bit of a nerf. 
Partly because of the way in which the morale phase works now with combat attrition. Yes, you're more likely to give them a combat attrition role, but it's not the same kind of, let's say, anti-horde thing that you might have found before. I think if you're going to be running Silent Shroud, you probably still want your Triple Shadow Seer and Death Jester kind of mortal wound bomb. That's kind of where you're where you're going to play into Silent Shroud, which in some ways, with there being less on the table, makes it more effective against like you know the more elite, uh, smaller units that we're going to see uh, around, uh, you know, quite a lot I think now. Um, but overall, the the reduction to leadership I don't think is necessarily the best bonus nowadays. And then on top of that, with Overwatch becoming a stratagem, having that as your stratagem to ignore Overwatch for two CP seems a little bit steep at this point. Um, so, I think that generally the Silent Shroud has probably been nerfed a little bit more than the other masks. That's not to say that it doesn't have a few tricks up its sleeve to play still. Either way, let me know what you think. Um, what have you guys been playing? Um, how have you been enjoying it? How have you been enjoying the changes in terms of like which, with the mask that you play? Um, do you think that your mask has become a lot stronger or weaker? And, and what is it exactly that you like in terms of your combos? using those different new stratagems from uh, Psychic Awakening and, and the new 9th edition rules. What has been working for you? I'd love it if you could share by writing a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, I've been Kit. This has been Ghost of the Webway, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.